Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to NowFaith.tv. Tonight is one of our most special classes. Some people say that it's the backbone of the entire course. I hope that if there's no other video that you listen to more than once, it's this one. I've found that students often just want to even stop and pray right in the middle or ask questions. Well, tonight I'm going to be giving you some answers. You've been very patient as we've laid a very strong foundation over the last seven weeks. And tonight I'm going to be pulling it all, all together. You're going to be getting to some answers about uh, what does um, a stronghold have to do with anything? What do we do? What, how do we pray about it? This is not the lesson on strongholds, but you're going to begin to see how if you don't pray the crosswalk prayer, if you don't take care of these things as they begin to accumulate in your life, your judgments, your criticisms, your resentment, your bitterness, unforgiveness, what happens? You're going to begin to understand more clearly the difference between a bitter root expectation, which is more of a psychological thing, and a bitter root judgment, which actually violates God's laws. I'm going to be sharing more with you about how these sowing and reaping cycles develop into downward spirals, into patterns, into bondages and addictions in our lives, and how to minister to that. First of all, though, let me lead you in prayer. And let's just humble ourselves before the Lord, knowing that a blind spot by definition is something that we don't know is there. And when I went into a strongholds course, or even into this teaching on bitterness, I was just sure that I had dealt with everything. And of course, that was the spirit of bitterness telling me, you don't need this, this isn't for you. But let's ask the Lord to open the eyes of our understanding, like Ephesians would say, to open our spiritual eyes and ears, and to enlighten us so that we won't be the last one to know. Amen? Amen. Father, I just thank you that you are quite willing that your Holy Spirit will rush to perform any verse that we will pray and declare and believe, and that as we pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that our spiritual eyes and ears would be open to your Holy Spirit as we choose to receive the conviction and the discernment of ourselves that you desire to bring to us tonight, that there will be revelation, that we won't be the last to know, that we will be able to discern ourselves even between our soul and spirit, even between the thoughts and intents of our heart, so that we will know what is in our heart, because the Bible said it's out of our own mouth <laughs> that these things come. And Lord, we want to be able to cooperate with you, to be that one that is not only a hearer, but a doer. And so we come against every assignment of the enemy against us to blind us, to make us not hear, to keep us from not discerning ourselves, to cause us to focus on others and how they need to change, and to judge them, which also makes our situation worse. And so we choose to look at the log in our own eyes. And I'm, I thank you, Lord, even for all the experiences and the temptations that have come into our lives lately. It always happens during ministry training school so that we can see ourselves more clearly. We even thank you for those that you brought into our lives to be mirrors to us, <laughs> to show us where our rough edges are. And as we discern that evil thing in them, then you're able to convict us that it's in us also. So with the spiritual power and authority that you've given to us, we come against every sign of the enemy to keep us from hearing your Holy Spirit tonight, to keep us from seeing what you want to show us, to keep us from discerning ourselves. And we cancel every assignment of the enemy against us, our pets, possession, and property, everything and everybody we care about. We cancel every assignment of backlash, backup forces, backup assignments of every kind, every hex fell, cursor incantation, anything that would keep us locked in to a pattern or a bondage or a downward spiral or automatic sinful reaction or behavior. And we say that we will be free, that we will receive the truth tonight. And the Bible says that they are the willing, that are willing to know the truth, will be free and will know the truth. And so we receive that. We receive your Holy Spirit. We receive the conviction. If we need it, we receive clarity and certainty so that we will know if we're lined up with the Word of God or not. We receive ability to focus on ourselves and the log that's in our own eye instead of the the twig that's in someone else's eye. We receive words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and prophetic words that would show us, that would quicken to us, that would become rhema words to us to give us understanding. We receive the spirit of wisdom and counsel and understanding and power and might and the fear of the Lord. 
and that we will not judge ourselves on the curve or by the norm in the secular community any longer, but we will let the Word of God be the plumb line in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that every year <laughs> you're patient with us and you give us more insight. And we thank you for your unconditional love and acceptance, Lord, but we ask you not to leave us the way we are. We pray that we will be those that are healed and offer healing to others rather than those that are hurt and hurt others as well. And we'll give you all the glory and all the thanks, and we won't give it to a book or a method or a school or a class, but we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Tonight I'd like to open with a story about how my friend tried to help me. I had uh, some downward cycles in my life that I couldn't get over with, uh, get over especially to do with relationships, and that was particularly perplexing because I was a mental health nurse. And all the knowledge did not set me free. I tried different types, modalities, different methods, and I was not getting free. So I, I want to share that she insisted that I read a book by Harville Hendricks, and I'm not coming against him, but it was just part of my journey. She said, this is a book about how to get the love you want, and she felt that it would clearly, it would clearly help me. And it, what Harville Hendricks suggested, being a secular therapist, is that I would make a list of all the faults that my parents had, all the faults in my original family, and I would become cognizant, you know, think, become cognizant of the type of person that you're drawn to because this said that person that you're describing, they're all the faults that were in your original family, that is an imprint that's made in your imago, you know, like in the base of your brain. And unconsciously, when you go into a room, it can be 200 people, it can be a new church, it can be a party, it can be a gathering, and you will be unconsciously drawn toward the person that is most like your family. But that includes all of these faults. And so Harville Hendricks was suggesting that if we become aware of the bad choices that we keep making, perpetuating the negative cycles in the generations of our family, that we can beat this system. Well, I tried it. I tried it more than once. Now, there was much more to his book. I wouldn't say that's all there is. I wouldn't be giving him credit. But it wasn't going into the spiritual answer. It was merely, from my point of view, identifying the problem. And he was saying that if we become mentally aware of making wrong choices, then we can re-decide or we can make better choices in our own strength. That's basically when I got out of it. Well, he was saying that this imago helps to determine our choices. And we, but that he was also saying, giving me hope that I could beat it. I began to understand why people tend to marry people with the same flaws. Why we tend to pick those same kind of relationships with pastors, with employers, and even if that person is not like that in the beginning, how over time they become like that. And this lesson to me gave me many examples, many answers. And I was asked to speak at the Christian Counselors Association in Tallahassee, Florida, and little did I know that there was an imago therapist there. And I used this example, and I said, if you have broken God's spiritual laws, and you have dishonored your parents, give me a minute to recap here the foundations that we've laid already, if you have judged them with condemnation, not just spiritual discernment, if you've made fleshly inner vows that you would never be like them in your pride, I guess expecting to fulfill that in your fleshly strength, then you're dooming yourself to become like what you focus. You become like what you judge and dishonor. You become like what you condemn and make fleshly inner vows that you would never do that. Well, the more you focus on something, the more you become like it. But it's not just that psychological principle. The Bible says that spiritual laws are not broken, that they break us, really. And so you cannot beat this imago. <laughs> um, you can't beat this with imago therapy is what I was telling them because no matter how well you understand what you are reaping, if you do not repent of having sown these judgments and dishonor and condemnation and criticisms and fleshly inner vows, 
If you do not repent of them, you will continue to reap them. If you do not renounce them, they will stay in force because they are spiritual laws. This is not just a psychological thing that can be understood and then you can just decide not to do that anymore. Well, much to my surprise, someone had a question at the end and they introduced themselves as a MAGA therapist. I was going, oh my word, it's almost like any time you mention a denomination in a class, somebody's surely going to be there from that denomination. She stood and she said, I see what you're saying, you're exactly right. And I had been bold. I was saying, when we lead people to believe that if you decide not to basically reap something anymore, not to um, participate in this reaping pattern anymore, that it's going to make a difference. We're taking their money, but we have no way to um, help them out of that pattern just by identifying the problem. That we have to repent and to renounce our judgments and our criticism and our um, inner vows not to be like people. We have to renounce the ways we've disrespected them and dishonored them in order for this pattern not to be perpetuated. And she saw it, and I think everyone there did. It's okay to discern, but it's especially wonderful to spiritually discern. But it's not okay to judge with condemnation. And the Bible is saying, as you learned last week, that the more we don't forgive, the more unforgiveness we have in our heart, the more reaping process we have. The things that we don't forgive people for, we're due to reap more of it. The very thing that we don't want, we get more of it in ourselves and others. Try it. If you criticize someone for being critical, are you not the same way the Bible says? If you say, I just can't stand how proud they are and you're judging your brother, brother the Bible says you're proud too. <laughs> if you say, if there's one thing I can't stand as a judgmental person, then you're judging them. <laughs> it's, we're just bound and determined by the nature of a spiritual law to reap that which we've sown. And so... No matter what it is, the more we focus on it, the more we become like it, or we reap it in other people. Now what I would like you to do, if you haven't done it already, is to stop and print out the scripture prayer strategy that I sent out, because it's also kind of a note-taking outline, and I left spaces in between the verses, so that you can make comments in between, if you would like, as well. I want you to understand that um, the more... We, the longer that we let unforgiveness go, or resentment go, or unforgiveness, or judgments, or dishonor, or wrath, or desire to retaliate, the longer we let it go, the longer it's lodged in our hearts, the longer it becomes a negative force in our life, and the more we reap, the more generations, for instance, that weeds grow in your yard, the more you have, right? Well, it's the same way with this. I want you to understand tonight, though, what a bitter root is. The Bible says to be careful not to let a bitter root or a bitter root judgment, the phrase has been coined, spring up in you. A bitter root is parallel, similar to roots on a tree in the natural. First of all, roots are usually mostly underground, right? They're not obvious to us. Other people can see our bitter roots, but usually we can't. A root is a way that a tree drinks nurture. And in the same way spiritually in us, a root is a habitual way that we drink nurture, either from God or from others or ourselves or from nature. And our roots also lie beneath the surface and they're usually hidden to us, usually hidden to the adult mind because so many of the bitter root judgments that we made, we were children. We don't remember them. However, it's not like they expire after a few years. It's not like Satan says, well, that's over seven years, so I won't count that as legal access anymore. Bitter roots are formed when we have a sinful reaction to hurt, when we make condemning judgments of other people, when we have a refusal or an inability to forgive someone right away. We might say, I'll just do that tomorrow. When we have... Um, a bitter root. We, none of us want to believe that we have them, but it's simply sin plus time. It's when you've criticized, you didn't ask for forgiveness, 
or you didn't forgive the other person for the hurt, and you let time go by. That's why the Bible says, be angry, but sin not. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to say, I'm angry at you, that you're really hurting me. You're on my last nerve. It's okay to say something. It's okay to confront people. This lesson it is no way saying that you cannot confront people about behavior that encroaches on your boundaries or hurts you. It's not saying that you can't confront people, but it's saying that we don't judge them with condemnation. We don't just develop a pattern of just being critical. So there's a difference. If, if you find it difficult to confront, I don't want this to make it even harder for you. But there are things in our lives that we can remember readily. There are hurts and traumas where if you can remember that from your childhood, there's a strong likelihood that as a child you judged or dishonored. And if you never knew to ask forgiveness or never did, ask God to forgive you for judging that person, then you can be sure that it has become a bitter root. It's not that you have to be consciously feeling bitter. That's not what it's about. It's not about an emotion or a feeling. But a bitter root is more powerful than a bitter expectation, for instance. An expectation is more of a psychological thing. It's a um, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's true that when you expect someone to fail you, if you expect them to be critical, if you expect them to mess things up, then there's a good chance they will, because even with that you're defiling them, but that's not quite the same as breaking of the spiritual laws like God's laws not to judge your brother, for instance, for there's no excuse if you do. Luke 6 says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I don't think there are that many of us that take it seriously that Luke 6, 37 and 38 is saying, Forgive and you will be forgiven. Not that many of us picture ourselves as having many areas in our life that have not been forgiven by God because we kind of judge ourselves on the curve. But the Bible says as we pray scripture, the word of God will help us to discern between the thoughts and intents of our heart. We may have thought condemnation but not intended to actually sin. But we were sinning and we need help from the word of God. So that's why I've given you a scripture praying strategy. The Bible says that we are forgiven as we forgive our debtors, again in Matthew 6, 12. Leviticus 19 said it out clearly in the Old Testament that you will not hate your brother. <laughs> you shall surely rebuke your neighbor, it says. You can rebuke your neighbor if they need rebuking. And, but don't bear sin. Don't do sin at the same time. You know, you can confront a rebuke without sinning. And you may have to think through it ahead of time be led of the Holy Spirit. But you don't take vengeance, it says. You don't bear grudges. Um, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. There have been many times when I needed correction, and I might not have liked it too much at the time, but in the long run I was glad. Amen? But these uh, sinful condemnations that we thought or said or did, we're usually done as children. Most of our bitter roots are uh, set in place by the time we're six years old. It's not just that our personality is, it's that that's when we have so many judgments against our parents and our authorities. Um, it's when we're very little and we don't know better. As we've said before, just because you're younger than the age of accountability um, does not mean that you're not accountable for anything. It just means that if you die before you receive Christ, at that age that you know God's not going to hold it against you and send you to hell but it doesn't mean that sin isn't sin so think about that and help ask the Lord to help you to understand that clearly Ephesians 4 31 and 32 says let all bitterness wrath anger and clamor um, you know be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you so there's verse after verse that we could go through telling us not to do these things and yet we tend to wink at them. We tend to think when we expect that person to go off on us or we expect them to cheat on us or we expect them to talk negatively about us that that's okay. And it's really not even okay to have an expectation. Some of the most common expectations that I come across that are bitter expectations or negative expectations 
Um, and I saw this in the Sanford course in, in our text, Transformation of the Inner Man, as well, and I felt very validated when I saw these. One of the most common bitter or negative expectations that I see in men, it's like, don't tell a woman anything. They'll use it against you somehow. And, and they expect a woman to try to get power over them or, or to use it against them. And they'll say, women are critical. They expect women to be critical. What they don't realize is that when you have judged your mother, for instance, for being critical, and then you expect other women to be critical, that you're not only defiling them, but you're due to reap critical women because you have judged and condemned your mother for being critical. And that goes for women, too. You judge and condemn your father for being critical, then you're due to reap men that are critical. And so it's not just that uh, that's confirming your expectation that men or women will be critical. It's that you're reaping a disproportionate number of them because you just your parents and now you're reaping it. Well, this has a huge impact on our decision to marry. Um, we might find that that person doesn't seem to be critical at that time, and then after we marry them, it seems that they are. It's Part of that is due to the fact that they may have had a tendency that way but we are also defiling them because we are due to reap criticism because we've judged others for being critical or, if you will, criticized others for being critical. Another common one is to believe that people will not hear you. They will not listen to you. They will not validate your feelings or understand your choices and preferences. And of course, the more you expect that, the more you get. Another bitter root expectation that's very common is um, to believe that well, this is for girls. Um, like if you ask a, a class, um, if somebody messes up and everybody has to stay in and doesn't get to go out to recess, who did it? And all the girls will immediately say, the boys did. The boys always mess everything up. Well, that's a bitter expectation. And some of us haven't outgrown that. We still expect the boys to mess things up. Amen. <laughs> Um, also, girls can have an expectation that men will deceive them, that they will um, present you know, one picture and then change after they marry them. But it might be a shock to some of those women to find out that men have a similar expectation. They expect women to deceive them and not be honest with them. What happens? They reap each other. They reap each other. About the time you begin to understand these teachings, and you begin to understand why you're reaping more and more of the same thing, it finally dawns on you, somebody's reaping me. <laughs> I'm the a fulfillment of somebody's bitter expectation. Oh no. Well, another expectation that we can have is of leadership. We can believe that they'll be distant, that they'll be unavailable to us, that they won't notice us that they will just use and abuse us, <laughs> not really be investing in, in our future, but using us to build their own. When you keep expecting this, when you expect them to condemn you, um, to um, judge you, then the more of that you get. And so we need to repent and renounce of those expectations. The Bible says that um, we need to be careful Careful, Hebrews 12, 14 through 16, and look carefully lest we fall short of the grace of God. So we need to be seeing everyone through the eyes of grace. Through the eyes of grace, that's why Jesus came and died, showing us grace, even while we were still enemies, Romans 5 says. But what we want to do <coughs> is realize that it's out of the treasure of our heart. It's what we speak with our mouth, Luke 6, 45 says, out of the treasure of our heart that what comes out of our mouth is what puts the fruit on our tree. That we are actually speaking our own future into existence. And the more we have judgments and dishonor of other people in the past, the more our future will become like our past. And you're going, oh no, I don't want that. I don't want that. Well, it works for the good too. It works for the good too. But Tonight we're focusing on how the sowing and reaping process can work long term to make your present just like or actually worse than your past. For instance, a man that's brought up, say, with a critical mother, he's feeling wounded and rejection, and he learns to protect his heart by withdrawing from the woman. <laughs> 
His experiences with his mother form his picture of women. This is in his imago, as Harville Hendricks would say. When he marries, he expects and fears criticism and consciously or unconsciously projects his expectations onto his wife. So he's already seeing her through a critical lens before she opens her mouth. She becomes a little lonely, though, because she detects this distance that he's keeping from her, that he's withdrawn, that he's got that inner vow, don't tell women much, they'll use it against you or they'll criticize you. And so she detects that, and so she starts moving forward. It's like this dance happens. He start, starts to step away from her at the, when he's consciously you know, expecting something negative, and then she's noticing that he's pulling away, and so she's interpreting that as rejection. If she says anything, if she says, Honey, where are you? What are you thinking? You know, why don't we spend some t time together? He doesn't hear it is what she said. He hears it that criticism is coming. She doesn't think I ever do enough. So he interprets this as criticism, whether it is or not, and he pulls further away. Then she pursues him more for a while, but not forever, usually. So when she becomes openly critical of his treatment of her, she doesn't, he doesn't see his part in pushing her away and withdrawing her and expecting her to fail. He just sees, sure enough, the woman is critical. So bitter root judgment, see now, isn't just an expectation. At that point, he's judging her. He's judging her with condemnation. He's dishonoring her. He's labeling her. And so underneath his expectancy to be criticized in earliest childhood, he made condemning judgments of his mother. Now he's judging his wife. He has forgotten that he judged his mother. He's forgotten that he sows these seeds. He doesn't realize that he's just reaping critical. In fact, he could have married someone else and he would have gotten it.